Hello everyone, happy 2021 and welcome to a brand new course here at Long Island University, Brooklyn, Introduction to the United Nations. My name is Dr. Michael Rossi and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and the director of the program in international relations and I am absolutely thrilled and honored that you are all here for the premiere of this course. Yes, this is a brand new course. In fact, this is a class that is uh, a core element within the new uh, major in international relations and is one of the flagship courses uh, that characterizes our new certificate in international relations, languages, and diplomacy, which uh, the poli sci department was uh, honored to uh, receive as part of a generous grant under the direction of my friend and colleague, Dr. Dalia Fahmy, uh, this past summer, in which we are able to offer a series of courses this semester and all of next academic year um, that will allow you to custom design uh, your education and kind of add a unique feature to both your major and your diploma uh, in the study of the relationship between language, communication, and diplomacy. And so it is a perfect opportunity uh, to use this course on the UN and examine all forms of diplomacy, both formal as well as behind the scenes, um, as a way of exploring how language and meaning are used and oftentimes misinterpreted between uh, different cultures, different languages, um, what certain words imply um, in various UN resolutions and general assembly agreements, um, what um, you know, various um, phrases and connotations and slogans and slang words um, are understood by um, within a global context. And so this course, which is not necessarily focused on language and diplomacy, but uses that as one of its main areas of study, um, I think adds a rather unique qualitative approach to a course uh, that would otherwise just simply be um, a general introduction and survey um, into the workings and functions and operations of the United Nations. So by enrolling in this class, uh, you not only are on your way towards qualifying for uh, the certificate um, as early as this coming fall, um, but you are also uh, well versed in adding um, a specific area of study into um, hopefully either an IR major or an, an international relations specialization. Uh, within either political science, the larger liberal arts, or even within, um, you know, more professional-oriented schools like pharmacy, business, and nursing, right? So, you know, with that said, uh, this class is formally titled uh, An Introduction to the United Nations, even though uh, it's listed within the course roster as UN Theory. What will we be looking at? This class is, before anything else, an examination of the historical, the theoretical, and the practical foundations of what is really the paramount international governing organization in the world, the UN. Right? And I'm going to go on the assumption right, that uh, you all know <laughs> that this organization exists, um, that it has a significant impact um, in global affairs and shaping international uh, public policy. But you know, beyond uh, just simply defining the structure and function of the UN, as well as identifying its main organizational bodies, uh, we will also be examining the influence the United Nations has on what I call norm setting, right? Norm setting in areas of diplomacy, security, peacemaking, human rights, and economic development. So, you know, long story short, our coverage of the United Nations is more than just simply um, an abstract observation of the organization itself but a study into how much trust, how much um, legitimacy, and how much expectation the public has in this organization, right? So, you know, I'm not going to sit here and candy coat the UN as the be-all, end-all sinecure to all of the world's problems, right? If you know anything about the UN beyond its existence, right, you also know that the United Nations is oftentimes critiqued, um, sometimes fairly, more often than not unfairly, 
in not being able to address many of the pressing problems of the world today and oftentimes you know, kind of comes across as something that's usually about, you know, five to 10 minutes late uh, to any major crisis. So this class is also going to be offering an honest critique of the United Nations actual capabilities versus what the public sort of expects it to do, right? What, what we think the UN should do versus what the UN can actually do. And I think that this is um, an important point to note here because what many people, the U.S. and elsewhere, think the U.N. should do, more often than not, involves things that are beyond its capabilities, its mandate, its authority, and its reach. So I don't want you to think that the U.N. is going to be this emerging global government that will, you know, eventually supersede the sovereignty and the authority of, you know, the 190 plus states out there in the world. Um, if that ever happens, it's not going to happen, certainly in my lifetime, and I'm going to put money on the fact that it's not going to happen in yours. Um, so suffice to say, right, the United Nations is an international organization that um, you know, is given certain powers and limits by the states that comprise it. Um, and even though the UN might be hampered by, you know, a number of, you know, bureaucratic red tape, um, as well as just, you know, general mismanagement and self-interest by many of its member states, um, there is a growing understanding that the United Nations should, at the absolute, absolute least, serve as a moral guide in directing um, international relations and global affairs uh, from the 21st century onward. So, you know, it, long story short, you know, whether you like it or you hate it, right, the UN is the best thing that we've got. And, you know, rather than trying to get rid of it um, because it doesn't do anything, uh, we might want to try to think about what we can do to make the UN better and more influential. Um, in, you know, in tackling and addressing uh, a number of transnational crises, challenges, and problems. So before we move on into the specifics of class, um, I feel like it's necessary to just kind of go over uh, the general and, uh, you know, required rubrics of, um, you know, how the class is designed and what I expect from you. Um, first and foremost, this class is a core requirement for IR majors, and there's a few of you in class. Welcome to, you know, welcome aboard, and for some of you, welcome back. Um, it is also, uh, good news, um, a major core course for the certificate in languages, diplomacy, and international relations. So the fact that you are in this class means that you are well on your way to qualifying for that certificate. So stay here. <laughs> I want you to stay. Um, in fact, because this is a brand new course, you're all sort of serving as, you know, really, um, you know, analyzers. You know, you're sort of, you are the first group of students that this class is designed for. And so I would really um, appreciate your input, your evaluations, your thoughts, your comments on how the course is structured and what you think we can do better to make it more engaging down the road. Now, I know that we are offering this uh, course uh, still knee deep in the COVID pandemic. And the fact that I'm recording this lecture online um, implies already a couple of things. First, um, well, first of all, um, the weather report is uh, sort of increasingly telling us that we are uh, about to get a significant snowstorm on Monday when we first meet. So um, pending whether or not we're actually going to be on campus on Monday, um, I've decided that I'm going to record this lecture and put it up on YouTube for you all to access either before the semester formally begins or um, if we can't meet during our designated time on Monday. But the second thing is because COVID has sort of forced a lot of us to adapt to online learning, digital education, whatever it is that you want to call it, I've also decided, um, like I have my classes in the spring semester, to structure courses around what I call a flipped classroom, right? A flipped classroom model in which 
much of the teaching, the formal lecturing, you know, the PowerPoint, you know, the stuff that you, you know, you come to class, you, you spend an hour and 15, an hour and 20 writing notes down from whatever the professor is talking about. That's all going to be online, right? So it's not that I'm recording just this one lecture because of the impending snowstorm on Monday. I'm going to be doing that for every week. And what that effectively does is it frees up time that we would otherwise spend either in the classroom or for many of you who are accessing it remotely, dialing in on Zoom, which I think by this point, um, those remote students, A, I can imagine you're kind of sick of Zoom. Uh, B, there is a very high likelihood that at some point, let's say I was giving a lecture in class and you were listening in via Zoom, that one of our internets is going to conk out. Um, either the internet in the classroom, because it's where we are, or the internet where you are, because of just bandwidth overload. And if it doesn't conk out, there's always the, you know, the screen freeze, the voice lag, um, you know, a whole bunch of unnecessary obstacles that, you know, get in the way of you listening, learning, and critically analyzing. So I decided to take that element out, especially because of the hybrid model that we have, right? So, you know, instructors are in a classroom talking to, you know, about half of the class that are sitting there, and everyone else is dialing in on Zoom. And, you know, you've already had a semester or, or and a half knowing this, right? Um, the you log in through Zoom and you hear the instructor's echo because the sound quality is bad. And for those of you that have been in LIU now for a number of years, you know that the classrooms, there, there's no soundproofing, right? Everything reverberates because the acoustics are horrible. So try just, you know, taking that sound reverb and having that, you know, send through your computer screen. And it's just even more difficult for you to listen and pay attention to. And what's more is the camera is not going to be showing the screen per se, but you're going to see maybe the side of me or my rear end or something like that, right? You know, you didn't pay that amount of money for this poor learning quality. So I decided I'm going to put all the lectures online anyway. And that's for, you know, that's for people who are on Zoom, people who are in classrooms. And that way it just kind of simplifies the content that's being delivered to you. Now, the other element of that is because I have decided to do the asynchronous lecturing and have that up before we all meet for the week, that technically frees up one of the two days that we should meet. So I've also decided to use the online lecturing as our Monday class. And so rather than meeting Monday and Wednesday, we will only meet on Wednesdays as a group. So if you are remote, dial in. If you are on campus, come to class. But that is only for Wednesdays. So you don't have to do this twice a week. And I don't think anybody's really going to be all that opposed to it. Now, I will be on campus on Monday if anybody needs to speak with me or email me. It's not like I'll be inaccessible. But I think what that does is it frees up our time. Also, giving you the opportunity to access the lectures whenever you want and however many times you want. So you could access it, um, you know, at 12 p.m. on Monday. You can access it at 12 a.m. the previous Saturday. You can do, and you, and you can come back to these lectures whenever you want. They'll be there, they'll be archived. You can use it for writing your big papers, your small papers, right? So you have the, you, you have the information constantly at your, you know, click disposal. Um, and you, you know, that avoids you running the risk of, you know, I don't know, not paying attention, the internet kicking out and you're missing something critical. Okay. So from, so for this week, right, for this week, I would like for us to meet on Mondays and Wednesdays. And, you know, if we have a snowstorm, uh, we'll be meeting all on Zoom on Mondays and doing the same thing on Wednesdays. But the following week and from there on out, okay, we will meet as a group on Wednesdays only. And Mondays will be your reading and lecturing days. Um, there will be two weeks during the semester where we will meet on Monday instead for a midterm and final workshop.
And those two weeks, right, I haven't assigned any readings. There's no homework. There's nothing like that, right? We're preparing for the two big papers that you have to write, which I might as well just get to the bottom here, the two larger writing assignments. Um, one is, I would say, about eight to 10 pages. That's the midterm paper. And then the second one, the final paper, is about 10 to 12. We'll have plenty of time to go in workshop, talk about the structure, the content, the organization. On those days, we meet on Monday as opposed to Wednesday. Now, the other elements about class, right? Readings and lectures, good news. You don't have to buy anything, no books, no articles. Everything is provided by me. They are all ready for PDF download on Canvas. Some of you have already accessed the site. So you notice that there is a course reading list which reflects the syllabus and all the readings are there for you. You can print them out. You can read them on screen. I don't really care. All I care about is you coming to class or dialing in to class on Wednesday, having completed the assigned reading and watched the accompanying lecture video. If you've done both of that, you are ready for class discussion, which will be, you know, operated around more of a question answer uh, seminar format. Okay? If everybody comes to class prepared, there's no need for me to re-lecture the material again. Now, I'll find out pretty quickly if you've, you know, if you've come to class prepared or not. And I don't have any problems in ending class early and throwing you all out if you're not prepared. But I won't be happy about that. If you've done what you need to do, and you come to class on Wednesday ready to talk, answer questions, pose questions of your own, um, engage in maybe some small projects. Um, will be. This is going to be a fantastic, fantastic class. Um, to help you along in keeping up with the readings and also to make certain that you were understanding the material, I also like to assign what are called reading evaluations. Now, those of you that have had me beforehand uh, know that these reading evaluations are smaller papers, usually about five to six, seven pages, the absolute most. And these are um, smaller papers that focus on a particular section of class. Um, for this class, okay, we have three reading evaluations that are required and there are five sections. So what that means is there will be a reading evaluation attached to each section. You are required to do three of any five. Now, in this sense, right, the reading evaluations are about 30% of your grade. So each of the papers will be worth 10 points. You do three evaluations at 10 points each. You max out with 30 points. Let's say that after the third paper, you are a few points below 30, right? So let's just say, for instance, um, each of your three papers are 8 out of 10, right? So you've got 24 out of 30. If you play your cards right and you write the evaluations early enough, there's time for you to do a fourth or maybe even a fifth evaluation for extra credits for you to reach your 30 maximum. So while it's up to you to decide when to do the reading evaluations, I strongly, strongly encourage you to do the first three. That way, as the semester progresses and we get closer to the end, you don't have to worry about doing required readings or required uh, assignments, but rather doing them for extra credit, freeing yourself up at the end, um, saving yourself the time. And trust me, by the end, by, as we get you know close to mid-April, whatever, we're all going to be tired, we're all going to be exhausted. So I would recommend that you actually do the first three, even though it's up to you. That way, when it's time for the fourth or the fifth evaluation, they function as extra credits. And if you get all 30 points after, let's say, four papers, well, then there's just one less thing for you to do um, at the end of the semester. And finally, class participation, uh, which is 20% of your grade. Again, for those of you who have had me, class participation can either be the easiest thing for you to accumulate or the most annoying thing that prevents you from getting the grade you think you deserve. Because class participation is more than just simply showing up, but it's actually participating, engaging within the class throughout the semester. Now, normally this would be answering questions that I pose in class, 
asking questions in class. Um, you know, some people are a bit more talkative than others. So in addition to engaging in actual class time, whether you're on Zoom or in the classroom, I will also provide a number of discussion forums on Blackboard that will cater to the quieter, the shyer individual who's not really all that comfortable speaking, but wants to, um, you know, convey their thoughts. So discussion threads will also go towards class participation. These posts should be somewhere around, you know, 100 to 150 words and reflect your own thoughts and opinions about not only the question attached to the thread, but what we've got out of class for that section. Doing that will get you a point. Responding to another student's um, comment, whether you agree or disagree, same thing, about 100 or so words, will also get you a point. And even better, responding to a response, <laughs> right, will help get you a point. So your goal is by the end of the semester to participate 20 times, whether it is speaking in class, speaking to me directly in office hours about class-related material, participating in the online discussion forums, anything that shows that you somehow give a damn about being there will get you participation. Now, what's really cool about this is that reading evaluations at 30 points and participation at 20 allows you to maximize 50 out of 100 points. If you max out your 20 participation and your 20 reading evaluation, you are in significantly good shape to do well in this class. And again, those who have had me before know I assign a lot of work. The readings might be a little bit more than normal, but I give you enough of an opportunity to max out your scores. So while you might not be the best writer or you might not be the best uh, critical analyst as far as, let's say, the UN goes, the amount of small little work that you do and the dedication that you put into it will be rewarded. So for those who have had me in the past, yeah, I work you, but it's really difficult to get a bad grade in my class. If you do the work and you put in the time, at the absolute, absolute least, okay, you can walk away in this class with a B minus, maybe even a B. Do I give out A's? Absolutely. Do I give quotas for A's? No, right? An A is an A, a B is a B. If everybody does their work and does exceptionally well, and I give A's across the board, it's not because I'm inflating the grades. It's because you all earned it. And, you know, students realize getting an A in my class, they worked for it. That's refrigerator quality. So that's the overview of the class, right? You've got your readings that are provided by me. You've got your online lectures that are available before the week begins. You've got your big papers and your little papers. And I should also mention the reading evaluations can be used as elements of your larger papers. This is not plagiarism. You're writing both papers and the reading evaluations kind of serve as rough drafts, right? Kind of uh, dress rehearsals for the bigger papers. I know that some students tend to look at 8 to 10 pages or 10 to 12 pages as daunting, right? How am I going to write something that big? These smaller papers will help you out. Considering that the questions related to the reading evaluations will be related in some way to the bigger paper as well. So it's probably in your best interest to maybe get two evaluations out before the first paper and at least one, if not two, for extra credit for the second, right? So you can kind of take maybe that mid part of the semester off as far as evaluations are concerned. Um, and that's basically the long and short of it. I mean, you know, please take a look at the syllabus as far as what else is expected in terms of attendance, um, academic integrity, um, students with disabilities, um, and the idea that life goes on, right? I mean, look, we are taking this class amid global pandemic, um, a whole bunch of things that are just working day and night to prevent us from focusing on our schoolwork. And, you know, look, if at some point in the semester you feel that um, you're overwhelmed with stuff, um, especially if you're, you know, accessing class remotely, you know, you got problems at home, you've just got, you, you're stressed out, you know, you can't focus. Um, you know, those of you that have worked with me before know that if you approach me and you're honest with me and you tell me 
that, you know, you're freaking out and you just, you know, you need to kind of vent, I'm going to listen. So, you know, it's, I'm not going to chide you for being lazy or being apathetic. Uh, trust me, the, the amount of pressures and expectations that are on undergrads these days is something that I don't think anybody beforehand has ever experienced. So what I'm trying to say is, is that if you need to speak with me about problems that, are, that you're facing completing this class, please let me know sooner than later. Doesn't mean that I'm going to cut you complete slack, but it gives me the idea that you're being honest and that we can work something out. I hope that we don't get to that. Right? I hope that you're all able to you know, handle the material and uh, just finish it out uh, within 14, 15 weeks. But I want to just let you know that I'm here. There is that lifeline. Right? I am willing uh, to listen if there are any issues. All right, so and I don't want to spend any too. I don't want to spend too much more time on the logistics of class. Everything is, um, you know, enumerated, listed uh, in the syllabus. If you had an opportunity, please look it over. Um, please also note um, about attendance policy, uh, lateness. That also includes, um, you know, you, you know, dialing into Zoom late. Um, please also let me know. Um, about, um, you know, any counter, you know, any issues that might prevent you from coming to class that day. Um, if you feel like you want, if you're in class and you want to switch over to remote for one, day, for one week or whatever, that's fine. Just let me know. Uh, my big thing is I want everybody here and ready to rock and roll um, at 12 p.m., right? Whether you're in class, I want you in class. If you're on Zoom, I want you on Zoom. 12 o'clock, we're ready to go. Okay. All right. So with all of that said, right, let's begin. And I just want to use this opportunity to briefly introduce um, the big scope of our class. I'm not going to be focusing on the readings just yet, uh, but this is kind of, you know, an overview of what we'll be looking at and uh, what is expected of you. This class looks at specifically the United Nations in current global affairs. And as I mentioned before, right, many of you are familiar with the UN. It is the world's largest international center of governance, right, just bar none. And the closest thing that we have, and as I said, probably will get to a world government. Now, like I said, we're not, the UN is not poised to become a world government. We will not have a planetary parliament. That's not happening really anytime soon. Um, the UN, of course, is pervasive. It is ubiquitous, at, you know, on the international level. There are five main headquarters, uh, not just in New York, the big one, but there's also headquarters in Geneva, in Vienna, Nairobi, and The Hague in the Netherlands. So if any of you are thinking of maybe working at the UN uh, after you graduate or after you get out of grad school. Um, you know, New York is a great place to work in, but so is Switzerland, Austria, Kenya, and the Netherlands as well, right? right? Especially if you're keen on uh, working abroad. The United Nations is also, if it's anything at all, an open forum for debate that is used and abused by its member states to pursue collective action and national interest in the name of collective action. So, you know, herein lies one of the biggest problems. And this is something that, um, you know, sort of predates the UN, uh, even back to its predecessor, the League of Nations. And that is the United Nations is as powerful, as authoritative, and as functional as its member states allow it to be. And... You know, while there are 193 uh, members of the United Nations currently, and, you know, we could certainly look at the General Assembly and say each of these countries are equally represented, right? There is no difference between uh, the delegation of Haiti versus the delegation of the United States until we look at the Security Council. Um, or the International Court of Justice, or the Economic and Social Council, and we begin to realize that, yeah, there are some states that are clearly more powerful than others, and they use that leverage to, you know, kind of get what they want. Um, not just the, at the UN, but, you know, elsewhere. You know, for those of you who had me um, last fall 
for international organization, um, this is something that is pervasive, right? It's not just the UN. We can find it in NATO, the EU, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the IMF, you know, you, you, know, you name it. So, you know, the United Nations is not uh, somehow unique to this problem of being a tool for powerful states to wield self-interested policy. And, uh, you know, particularly in the first couple of weeks, when we look at the um, historical uh, foundations of the United Nations, we, you know, begin to realize that, you know, within, let's say, the first two decades, uh, the place was just really a tug of war between the United States and the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, even still today, uh, there are five countries, five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, that wield exorbitant amounts of influence on said council through their uh, power of veto, which gives these five countries, the United States, Russia, China, France, and the UK, um, you know, disproportionate degrees of influence, power, and manipulation over everyone else. So, you know, while the United Nations is kind of seen as a forum for, you know, international debate, uh, you know, there are a number of countries that uh, have certain degrees of power higher than everyone else. And, you know, regardless of that, right, people will look at the U.N., um, state societies, civil societies, NGOs, humanitarian organizations, they will look at the U.N. as the institutional body that creates global policy and promotes a sense of international interdependency. Right? And I think that this is definitely apparent, uh, not just in the last 30 years, you know, going all the way back to 1990 with the end of the Cold War, but definitely, let's say, the last 15 with, um, you know, documents like the Kyoto Protocols and the Paris Climate Accords and the Millennium Development Goals, right? <clears throat> all of these uh, policy papers, all of these um, goals and aspirations for climate control, for human development, for the rights of women, children, and minorities, the idea of tackling global poverty, um, tackling global illiteracy, um, examining, you know, the, the rights of, you know, the rights to clean water, to clean air. I mean, all of these things which, you know, seem to be um, morally uh, justifiable, right? It's not the vocation of any one country to put their name behind this, right? If, this is, if these are global issues, then the United Nations, whether, it's, whether it pens them or not, is seen as the organization that needs to make the accords, protocols, goals, whatever it is you want to call them, realized in the foreseeable future. And yet at the same time, as I've already mentioned, but it's worth repeating and emphasizing again, this class does not just look at the United Nations with rose-tinted glasses. Okay? Like almost all international organizations, the United Nations is in dire need of reform and reorganization. And you know, some of the literature that I've assigned for this class was written around the 70th anniversary of the UN's founding. Here we are about five years later, technically the 75th anniversary of the UN, and not much has really changed. And the need for um, pushing for internal, structural, and organizational reform um, becomes more and more apparent um, as global challenges increase every year, right? Especially, in my opinion, uh, the most pressing issue around the world right now, bar none, is climate change, right? That is like, you know, the first, second, and third most important issues. And the United Nations, unfortunately, at this point, does not really have the organizational capacity to do anything other than just simply say, hey, we should tackle climate change. So in a way, one of the big questions that we'll be asking throughout this class is how can the United Nations reflect the dynamics of world politics and global governance in 2020 when the organization is still structured to promote power alignments of 1945, right? This is kind of one of the big, big, big problems here, right? The United Nations, it looks like and functions really, if we went back in time to 1945, 1955, the UN would be great. But we're approaching 2025. And the UN is still seen as something that is increasingly reflective of global policy and power alignments of the 20th century. 
not something that is able to tackle the new problems and crises of the 21st. So I think that taking this class in early 2021 is, I couldn't think of a better time to take this class, right? I mean, I understand that, you know, a class on the United Nations doesn't necessarily sound the most interesting out there, and I want to thank you all for those who took it. But look, let me promote the reason for this. Look, I am not some UN wonk. I mean, I got my hang-ups about the UN. I got my criticisms about the UN. But I will freely acknowledge the critical importance of the UN, the unmistakable importance of the UN as an international governance body in an increasingly multipolar world. Now, for those of you who had me before in IR classes, you kind of know my take on the multipolarity of the world today. And, you know, in, in, a, in a very, very quick nutshell here, um, the world of 2021 is a world, what I like to call, after American hegemony, right? The United States is no longer a global hegemon. It is still very much a world power, don't get me wrong. But to assume that the United States will return to a position of global authority in the wake of Donald Trump is, at least in my opinion, a rather naive assumption. Uh, my colleagues might disagree with me on that. Some of my colleagues, both here at LIU and abroad, may say that um, you know a Biden administration is something that the world um, has been waiting for and uh, is eagerly waiting, eagerly uh, anticipating the United States uh, re-engaging the world. And to that, I have to say, yes, the United States will re-engage the world, right? I mean, within 12 hours of Biden's inauguration, uh, we are back on the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, Biden has certainly indicated that he is ready to um, re-engage the United States in the, non, in the nuclear non-proliferation agreement with Iran, right? So we are kind of re-emerging from uh, a period of isolation that uh, we had under Trump. But, 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 but we are coming back onto the world stage that is very different from where we left it four years, eight years, 10, 15 years ago. There are new powers in the world. And while they are not global hegemons, the, you know, countries like Russia and China and Iran, for instance, <clears throat> are three regional powers that may very well give American foreign policy some challenge, right? Some run for its money. Now, the one positive thing about this is that at least rhetorically, U.S. foreign policy is geared along principles of liberalism, whereas Russia, China, and Iran, among others, <clears throat> are much more openly and honestly operating within principles of self-help realism. So, you know, the U.S. image might still be attractive to some parts of the world, but I don't necessarily think that the United States has the capacity to serve as an uncontested global leader. And that's where the United Nations comes in, because if the world is increasingly multipolar, then it is in the interest of the UN to kind of serve as at the absolute least some kind of chaperone, <clears throat> right? Some kind of coordinator uh, that will seek to harmonize the foreign policy interests of Washington, Moscow, Beijing, Tehran, uh, and other major powers. And with this said, we also need to add to this the understanding that many of the world's problems today are increasingly, if not definitively, transnational. In other words, issues like global warming, uh, resource depletion, pollution, rising sea levels, global terrorism, uh, human migration, um, scarcity of food, this is something that is not specific to one country to, or to one region. And these are issues that, to be honest, no one state can address, right? Even if they had the capacity, the global power to do so, right? If the United States was still, um, you know, sort of the unipolar hegemon that it was in the 90s, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people in the Biden uh, State Department still believe that it is, um, you know, even if there's the case, we wouldn't be able to handle it, right? These are issues that no one state can address or has the global power or authority to address, 
right? And so with that understanding, there is a pressing need for some kind of coordinated international global governance. There's some need for cooperation, right? Now, we could sit here and say, yeah, sure. So all we really need to do is to have the United States, Russia, China, um, I don't know, Germany, Brazil, you know, some big heavy hitters all to sit down and agree on uh, coordinating climate change, um, coordinating green energy and doing this and doing that. Well, if that were possible, it would have happened already. You know, the, the, the trouble is, and this is going to be apparent when you get to your first readings, is that things like, let's say, global warming, climate change, the environment, many developing countries may, at least rhetorically speaking, realize, yeah, global warming sucks and uh, we got to do something about it. But their economic obligations and the pressures that are put on them by transnational economic uh, corporations are effectively telling them produce, 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 pollute, 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 um, you know, uh, carbon emission, carbon emission, carbon emission, right? And a lot of these developing countries are saying, look, you had your industrial revolution and you polluted the world and you got where you are. And now it's our turn. Um, and it's not that it's so glibly indifferent that they, that they don't care about polluting, but it's like, you know, we're not in a position to really go green right now. You know, that's something like, you know, a postmodern country like Norway or Finland or Iceland or, you know, even Canada might be able to do. Um, but, you know, because all the Walmart oriented sweatshops are in, you know, China or whatever it is. I mean, yeah, there's a reason why these countries are polluting the way that they are. So that gives us pause to think, all right, that there is a pressing need for some overarching international organization to, if not take control, at least provide some kind of direction, some coordination. Hence, the difference between government and governance, right? So this is the thing. The United Nations, if it has one goal through the remaining decades of the 21st century, is to serve as a coordinating body of international governance, right? A body that coordinates, guides, and organizes member states and leadership. That's the goal of the UN, okay? And so what exactly, you know, do we mean here? Well, on one level, right, we mean that the United Nations needs to take charge of at least deciding what is good for the world. But there's a paradox, because the United Nations has the capability of addressing global challenges and problems, but it lacks the coercive ability to do anything about it, right? And this is one of the things that, you know, people kind of dismiss about the UN, right? The, the UN is the constant and consummate backseat driver, right? The world needs to do X. Great. Do you have the ability of telling people to do? No, not really, right? The world needs to do this, 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 this. We should, you know, strive for these utopian goals. Great. How is that going to happen? I don't know, right? Ultimately, the UN will say it's up to the states to decide. Now, the drive-by critics will say, well, then the UN is useless. People who have worked at the UN understand how much their hands are tied. Because at the end of the day, the understanding is you can talk and theorize and promote and emphasize and market and even go so far as to threaten or even coer or, or beg. At the end of the day, it is up to the states to decide what to do. And the paradox really comes out when we note that the states possess that coercive power but even if they wanted to do something about it, right? So the UN says, okay, we got to clean up the earth. And, you know, a country like Germany is like, absolutely, we need to clean up the earth. I'm totally behind that. Germany can't do this alone. France can't do this alone. The United States can't do this alone. Look, in a parallel universe, Bernie Sanders was president. And in fact, he, got, he became president in 2016, not now. He, you know, got reelected for his second term. Bernie Sanders could have pushed forward the Green New Deal, but that would only have worked in the United States. He could still be talking about the need to address global climate change. And as long as India, China, Brazil, and other countries are doing their own thing, right, the United States is powerless. So in other words, states possess the coercive power to do what the UN wants, but they lack the means outside of their sovereign control, right? So once again, 
responsibility goes back into the international governance bodies, right? So that's why the United Nations, right, sort of pools resources and delegates sovereignty, right, or the states do, right, towards this type of international governance. So it's, it's a paradox only in so much as you recognize that we might have two diametrically opposed bodies. But if the states realize that they have to put in their own fair share, but if everybody does that, the UN has the capacity to coordinate said fair share into reaching these larger global transnational goals. Hence, what we mean by global governance, and this is you know, taken directly from the Commission on Global Governance, the sum of the many ways individuals and institutions, public and private, manage their common affairs. It is a continuing process through which the conflicting or diverse interests may be accommodated and cooperative action may be taken. It includes formal as well as informal arrangements that people and institutions have agreed to or perceived to be in their interest. In other words, the United Nations starts as an organization that creates the idea of what the world needs to look like and achieve in the near future. But those ideas are then given to the states to say, all right, do something about it. If the states decide to do something about it in order to make it internationally impactful, they have to do something about it, not just on their own, but at the UN as well, right? So the tasks are delegated out to the states. The states work within the UN and all of its sub-regional, sub-level coordinating bodies that, you know, work on everything you can imagine. And the UN just kind of serves as this processor for all of these things to happen, which leads us to think about the UN can be very successful. It can be very efficient if this envision process actually happens. But obviously things get, you know, stuck along the way, right? States have um, self-interested leaders. And, you know, I'm not going to just simply say that, you know, the world was on was put on hold for four years with Donald Trump. If it, you know, if, if, if I can say anything right now, the, one of the most dangerous people to the future environment of this planet is not in the United States, but the current president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, who is interested, if he could, in turning the Amazon rainforest into an exclusive country club. Right. I mean, the man just is, you know, is, is and it, it, look, it's not like Brazil started logging under his rule. Right. Brazil has been notorious in deforestation of the rainforest. But under Bolsonaro, uh, this guy has just determined to you know, make as much money off of it as possible. So even if the United States has the best interests in mind. Right. We still have other powerful countries out there that could, you know, prevent all of us you know, from having nice things. So hence the important need for global governance, right? Our study of the United Nations um, is placed within the last, let's say, 30 or so years since the end of the Cold War. And as I already mentioned a couple of slides beforehand, the Cold War ended not just this rivalry, this ideological rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, but it ended a bipolar arrangement of power in which the Soviet Union and the United States possessed enough uh, global authority to kind of balance each other's intentions and motivations out. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the world entered into, I would say, roughly about a decade and change of unbridled and unrivaled um, American unipolarism. So roughly, I would say, from maybe about 1991 um, until really 9-11, about a decade or so later, and then a gradual decline in U.S. prestige um, over the next 10 to 15 or so years. Um, this isn't to say that America just did a whole bunch of horrible things. I'm here to tell you that, you know, even in the absence of George W. Bush or Donald Trump or, you know, even Barack Obama, whose foreign policies was really no different, um, the unipolar arrangement of U.S. power uh, would have been temporary anyway. Um, eventually, new powers would have risen. Um, probably right now, uh, the biggest um, global challenger to U.S. authority is China. And, uh, you know, all indications 
uh, lead us to conclude that, you know, within, I would say, the next five to ten years, uh, China will probably surpass the United States um, in terms of economic output and in terms of its just, you know, its global footprint. Um, and there's reasons that we can talk about, you know, and discuss uh, why this is uh, in the coming weeks here. But the idea is, is that, you know, a new multipolar arrangement, um, especially when many of these countries um, are led by self-interested leaders with their own agenda, implies the need for the United Nations in providing some kind of coordination. Um, this is also true when we understand that the Cold War ended right around the very same time that the age of globalization began, right? So the Soviet Union collapses 1990, 1991, and by 1995, the internet becomes a thing, right? The internet existed beforehand, but really for only a small handful of comp sci nerds. After 1995, with the you know advent of really two big things, Netscape and Windows 95, um, the internet effectively shapes the age of globalization, which in this period is the dissemination of beliefs, ideas, trends, and information to previously disconnected groups and societies. So in other words, right, the world is becoming far more connected. People are getting access to information that they previously were either denied or prevented from getting. And, you know, look, you know, any Google search, any Wikipedia search, any YouTube search, right, will get you everything and anything you want, from videos of cute kittens to how to construct a homemade pipe bomb. And the thing is, is that globalization, if it really is this democratization of information, it is really a form of untapped and unrefined power that is now given to the public whereas previously it was the vocation of people in power. Now, alongside that, right, alongside this spread of information is the global triumph of neoliberal capitalism, which in no small measure was part of American unipolarism. The idea is that, hey, we defeated the Soviet Union, communism is dead, nobody wants it, let's all trade, let's all capitalize. And the problem with this 30 plus years later is that neoliberal capitalism has been, in my opinion, one of the biggest obstacles, one of the biggest preventers of social democracy in many parts of the developing world. We take a look at many countries in Africa. We look at the increasing socioeconomic discrepancies uh, between societies in Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia. Right? We begin to realize right? neoliberal capitalism has made a segment of the population of each country very rich and very affluent but it has also prevented a larger group of people, not from getting rich also, but from living a decent quality of life, okay? So, you know, the degradation of the environment, the dismissing of clean water, clean air, the literal um, mining of developing countries for raw materials, and natural resources um, has disenfranchised and disempowered a number of people. Hence the reason why there are so many internal conflicts in states today. Why human migration, asylum seekers, minority um, exploitation, ethnic cleansing, state collapse, the spread of global terrorism. I'm not saying that all of these are directly related to the you know, triumph of capitalism. But the idea is, is that it has certainly unmoored many groups, has weakened many states uh, for the pursuit of you know, market privatization. And as such, has kind of left wide groups of people adrift. This is something that the United Nations needs to address. Many of the issues in the, in the millennial development programs are looking at chronic problems that certainly existed before 1990, but have been exponentially exacerbated since then. We also need to take a look at technological advancements, right? Over the past 30 or so years, right? The world is operating faster, cheaper, and increasingly automated. Um, the fact that I am able to deliver this entire class to you effectively online, we don't even have to meet in a classroom, but we can talk over Zoom, we can chat, we can text, we can do everything 
kind of leads us to understand the democratization of information. But a lot of this stuff remains unregulated, uncontrolled. And much of the internet, much of the World Wide Web, right, can also be monopolized by corporations, information sources that will prevent you from getting the information that you need or channel you subconsciously into getting the information that they want you to get. This is something that the United Nations also needs to be at the forefront in addressing. So with all of this, right, many of the issues that we are facing in the 21st century point to expanding transnationalism. States are still the primary actors on the international arena, but they are no longer the only actors, and they no longer monopolize power and authority. States have lost their monopoly on information, power, identity, and other elements that they previously controlled and enjoyed. In the age of information, globalization, and others, right, other forces, non-state actors, pop culture, social media, um, cyber transnational groups now have a significant sway on shaping identity and orienting policy. And this is especially true when we look at the effects of non-state actors across state boundaries. Probably the most important, in, at least in the early age of this century, was the 9-11 attacks. Right? The war on terror began with the United States declaring war on a man and an idea not on a country. And since Al-Qaeda, right, some of, the most, some of the biggest threats to human security are not coming from a particular country, but from some disorganized group of global terrorists, like the Islamic State. Where are they? What happens to them? And because they were driven largely out of Syria, does that mean the Islamic State doesn't exist anymore? No, they exist online. So in this sense, right, threats Challenges to state security, transnational threats, are not just environmental. They're also cyber. They're conceptual. They're ideological. Okay? So what will this class then cover? Right? This class is really, in so many ways, looking at the role of the United Nations in being at the forefront of many of these global issues and challenges. So to begin, we will be examining the United Nations within a 200-year analysis of international institutional development, right? The United Nations is not just simply some spontaneous product of the last few hours of the Second World War, but is really um, an evolutionary um, endpoint to an increasingly internationalizing, institutionalizing uh, set of countries and interests. And along that way, we're going to be looking at the successes as well as the failures. So there's going to be a good amount of history and theory that goes along with that. And this usually forms the foundations of almost any uh, course on international relations. To that, we're going to be looking at the capabilities of the United Nations within the capacities that the member states give it. Again, one of the big things to learn about institutionalism in international relations is that organizations like the UN or the EU or NATO or whatever it is, they are only as powerful as the states make it to be. So you know, if people are thinking, is the United Nations ever going to become a world government? Well, it can become a world government by next week if all the member states decide to make it so. But considering that's not going to happen, uh, you can go to sleep at night knowing that there won't ever be one of those things. So the United Nations could completely and utterly tackle many of these problems today if its member states empower it to do so. And if the UN is unable to meet these challenges and just kind of look like all it does is just make these lofty rhetorical statements and platitudes, well, you know, I wouldn't necessarily just blame the UN for being useless and naive. I would blame the states for making the UN useless enough for them to sound naive, right, in that sense, right? And so, look, even within the capacities, limited as they are, <clears throat> that the UN currently holds, um, this class will identify the UN's role in shaping international policies of law, 
human rights, and probably most importantly, moral imperatives, right? Moral imperatives. Um, the UN probably, if, if the UN has one ace up its sleeve, it is that it has enormous ability and capability of wielding what we in the IR field called soft power, okay? Soft power. Hard power is usually, you know, raw, coercive diplomacy, right? I got a big, um, I got a big economy. I got a big army. I can make you do whatever I want. Yeah, that's, that's, that's hard, uh, you know, th that's hard diplomacy. Soft diplomacy is the images, the narratives, the behaviors and attitudes that, uh, you know, take a little bit longer to seep into public consciousness, but eventually gets the collective whole to think differently, right? And, um, you know, increasingly, especially over the last 30 or so years, right? Some of the biggest believers in the UN's moral imperative, you know, tend to come from people that are about 35 years and younger, right? Younger groups that realize that the UN is, if it doesn't have the capacity to make things happen, it has the moral authority to get people to start thinking that way. And, you know, in things like tackling global climate change and increasing global literacy and, um, you know, talking about the importance of human well-being apart from economic development. I mean, these are things that are rather normative and subjective in terms, but, you know, they really don't have a place in international financial institutions, right? You, you know, World Bank, the IMF, global corporations, they care about really only one thing, making money. Um, and if they drive a species into extinction, but, um, you know, someone's stock options are able to increase by 10% that year, well, you know, then so be it. The UN doesn't really hold to these callous beliefs, right? The UN does have this um, moral voice to kind of get people to think about the consequences of rampant neoliberal capitalism, um, of selfish, self-interested um, state policies. And, you know, if nothing else, the UN does go a long way in shaping and integrating uh, a global community. And this is definitely apparent outside of formal uh, state diplomacy, right? The UN isn't just simply a place where uh, foreign ambassadors and diplomats, you know, meet once a year. Uh, the UN has a sophisticated network of cooperations and uh, partnerships with a number of NGOs, um, humanitarian organizations. I mean, every major, um, you know, on the ground grassroots movement, you know, wants to have some kind of contact, some kind of representative, you know, at the um, at the UN. And so, in this case, the UN is in sort of an indirect advantage in setting global policy uh, for the 21st century by using and working with these lower level NGOs, humanitarian organizations, think tanks academics, what have you, in addressing um, policies, crises, and dilemmas that are truly uh, transnational, right? That, and that's, I think, one of the beauty of the UN is that, yeah, it's the closest thing that we have to an international governing body. And the people who work at the UN, particularly within the secretariat, um, they're paid to think globally, right? They're paid. Their goal is to look at the world not just a particular country, you know? So it's like if you want to go into, um, you know, working for the U.S. State Department or you want to work at, uh, you know, an American uh, foreign policy think tank, either in D.C. or New York, and at the end of the day, you're promoting company policy. Um, it's not what's good for the world, it's good for the country. Um, and if what's good for the world happens to be good for the country, well, you know, you have bonus points. But at the end of the day, you know, you're promoting the national interest of your country. You go to work at the UN, you're promoting the national, you're promoting the international interest of people, of the world, in this sense, right? So you think bigger, you think broader, you think beyond national boundaries and barriers. Um, and while that sounds great, and while some of you might be thinking to yourself, that's what I want to do after I graduate. I want to go work in the UN and, you know, make something of the world. 
First thing you got to know, you walk into the UN day one. The first thing you need to know is that where you work is in dire need of reform and evolution. So I will not mince words. The UN can be a voice for change and a hope for the world. It is also grotesquely corrupt, undeniably dysfunctional at times, and can be the victim of its own bureaucratic narcissism. So we will also be looking repeatedly at needs of bringing the UN into the mid-21st century and out of the mid-20th. This goes beyond just simply looking at um, strategies of reforming the Security Council, maybe even getting rid of the five permanent members, but, you know, streamlining ECOSOC uh, to work more uh, with grassroots movements, with um, perhaps allowing non-sovereign territories like Palestine and Kosovo and Taiwan and Northern Cyprus to have some kind of um, modicum of representation. You know, the other problem with the United Nations is that, you know, unless you're an internationally recognized sovereign country, you have no voice at the UN. You know, there's 193 states out there. That doesn't mean that that covers all parts of the world. Um, What do we do for those non-sovereign entities? Um, You know, do they have a voice? Are they left behind? Um, So, you know, this class is kind of a little bit of everything. It is an introductory course to the United Nations. I will do my absolute best to keep the class from being too structurally boring. Uh, And trust me, um, you know, textbooks on the UN will cure insomnia, uh, you know, at any moment. But, you know, I'm really hoping that with the dynamics of 2021 and the input that you can bring to class, having done the readings, listened to the lecture, and having thoughts and opinions of your own, we can at the absolute least come up with something creative for understanding how the UN works. Now, unfortunately, COVID is keeping us from being more directly engaged with the UN. Um, In better times, I would have uh, scheduled um, at least one, if not two, trips to the UN. Now, this may happen. We don't know where we're going in this semester. Things could get better. Uh, We could all be in lockdown yet once again. This is the problem with learning about international relations uh, during a pandemic, uh, you know, uh, lockdown here. We're kind of forced to kind of be insular. Um, But if the opportunity presents itself for us to meet with and engage with officials at the United Nations, at the absolute least, I can invite them to a Zoom chat. So I hope that all of this has enticed you to take this class. Again, for the first time, you are all kind of pioneers uh, with me in this. And I would really, really, really appreciate um, repeated um, evaluation of how the course is doing and what you feel we could or should be learning alongside what we are. So readings, ideas that you feel that we can add to a, you know, course, you know, to this course later on will certainly be welcome. But with all of that said, right, it is still you know, the beginning of the semester. Um, I would like for you to have, if possible, the three readings on the syllabus done for Wednesday. That's the first chapter of Carnes and Minxed, uh, the article by Roland Rich, and the third article by Nick Stanko, um, read for Wednesday. I will also provide um, another lecture that accompanies those three readings. And, um, you know, even if you find that the readings are a bit dense or you don't get everything, don't worry about it. The lecture video should hopefully uh, clarify and flesh everything out. But if you have all that stuff read and you have the video watched and you come to class on Wednesday, we're going to be ready to really, really rock and roll with this class. So welcome aboard once again. Um, I hope that you have an enjoyable semester with me, and uh, I hope that uh, your spring semester overall uh, gives you uh, lots of times and opportunities to think to be productive. And uh, let's, uh, you know, chug ahead uh, between now and May. So I will see you very, very soon. Take care, everyone. And once again, happy to have you with me.